because they did a language mess and so now they're starting to teach them at a young age. But my dad lost his language at 12 when he went to residential school. And one of the saddest things, the stories that he told me, was that he went to go talk to his grandma, but he could no longer speak Delta. And he could only speak to her in English, and she didn't speak English, and she didn't like English. And so she turned her back on him because he couldn't speak the language. So it's very important for us to know our language so that we can pass on those stories. I don't speak really hardly any uh, words in my language, but I'm passionately committed to preserving it and to passing it on. But I was telling today that I went through like, what was it, four tutors in two years and I got some pity pass in Spanish. So I'm just gonna put it out there that I don't speak any language besides English. <laughs> but I think that part of that is how we pass on those deeper layers of meaning, it's the only way we can do it is by having the languages. And part of the way that people deny access back to those records, to those archival records, is through closing um, times and through not accessing and having to make an appointment. So, for example, if I wanted to, if there was an archive, um, if there was some um, uh, material that was Teltan in Toronto, I didn't know until two days ago, uh, that I was going to Toronto. Well, I don't have time to make an appointment a month in advance. And that often happens with communities because the chief's going to be there in town, so he wants to access something in, in uh, Library and Archives Canada, but they have short hours, or you have to book in, in advance, or uh, they've you know depleted the funding for people to do customer service or to do online remote access to that. So it's really crucial, and I have to say that I I'm so impressed with Library and Archives Canada for the uh, program that they're doing with Indigenous languages now, where they're training people. They're going back in their own community. They're actually training them. Uh, I helped with some of the development in that curriculum. And they go back to their community. They work in their community, and they're paid to be in their community put out to doing language work and preserving that. So there's been some great headways happening. Um, across Canada with many different things, but we still have a long way to go. And um, I think that uh, part of that is that librarians aren't going to the communities. They aren't going and being part of that so they can see what the need is. And I will tell you, if you go and you be part of a community, but pretty soon you become one of the aunties that's there and you're welcomed into the community. But going to the community in a humble way is what's crucial because if we act like we know more because we have a master's degree, then they just laugh at us and call us educated and they ignore us. Mm -hmm. And that happens a lot. So we have to be very careful in how we approach it. It has to be with respect and with that reverence. But yes, we're still actively practicing our traditions. We still go back when the salmon's running in the river. Um, and I think that those are really crucial times when our communities come back together because we don't have a high school, so our community's been scattered, which all leads to some of those issues with the language and passing on traditions. So we have to make a concentrated effort to be able to do that. And I believe that um, in libraries and in archives and cultural women institutions, we have a huge role to play in that because we have so many people that we lost um, during the 60s scoop to our communities. And there's just as many children right now in care as there was in residential school. So we have to be that for those people. We have to work with the communities. We can't deny them access to their knowledge. I told a very sad story about that today, but things are being changed so that communities can access the public libraries, even though they live in a, in a, a reserve. And so we have to be part of that change. And I believe, I believe librarians ch can change the world. And that's part of what I love about this profession and being in this profession. And I believe that we have a huge role to play in this whole uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I'll talk, I might have to talk to them again about not putting us in there. But I think that part of that is really important that um, I think that we're seen as part of supporting that whole the calls to action. And in almost every one of the calls, we can see where libraries can play a role in it. So. Thank you for your question. Any other questions? <laughs> Thank you so much. And we will now just move on to the second portion, uh, which is to, to honor um, the Horrocks, um, our student.
with it today. And so I'm just trying to find where, oh great. And I would like now, uh, we're very fortunate this year uh, to have Norman's grandson, Nick Berry, who's here. So if I would ask Nick to join us at this point in time. show you where we still need lots of leadership and lots of uh, lots of room for people to to be that change and we think uh, we see that in you so congratulations Rachel so there are still while there isn't wine I was just thinking about that somehow our sim budget did not somehow <laughs> Uh, bring on wine, but I think we're going to have to change that for next year. Uh, but there are still some snacks left over there, so I encourage everyone to stay around for a little while and, and mix and mingle. Uh, and that is one of the things I love about our profession is, you know, we have uh, Camille come here and she's worked with so many of you. Um, so it's these connections that we make through, uh, through this profession and the professional associations. Uh, are so wonderful. Uh, just a couple of things as I'm closing up. I just really wanted to recognize uh, Laurel Sampson for all the uh, work she's put in into uh, this <laughs> evening. Uh, and if any of you organize events, you know there's always all kinds of fun challenges that come along that <laughs> way. Um, so we're very happy that, in fact, things came off very well. So thank you, Laurel. Um, just wanted to remind you that we also do have um, some uh, lectures coming up. Um, so the next one is on March the 8th. Yes. Uh, Warren Pruitt will be back. He has come here before to speak, so we're looking forward to that as well. Um, another exciting thing, it is, of course, our 50th anniversary this year. Uh, so we have not forgotten, so we'll be providing updates soon. Uh, and we're hoping to do a, a big event uh, during homecoming. Um, Fall Dallas's homecoming this fall, so please stay tuned. Uh, and then finally, if you're really looking for something to do this weekend, uh, we are of course hosting the third annual Open Data Competition uh, this weekend in the row. So I encourage uh, I encourage you uh, to drop by and see what we're doing there as well. Uh, and uh, it's, it's always this has been the second year in a row that we've had this lecture within day or two of me having to spend a whole weekend with our open data event. Uh, so that just, you know, shows that I, I'm not very good at event planning. So something, <laughs> something to work on for the future. Um, but thank you to everyone for attending and please do stay around and chat. Uh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>